21st February, the emperor's health. In the same state as yesterday, he wished to eat turtle cooked after the English fashion and refused his pills. I insisted upon his taking them. He grew impatient and bade me retire. I cannot, sire. I act by order. By order? Yes, sire. Of whom? Who has had the insolence? The general-in-chief. His instructions have just reached me. I held in my hand his own general order dated Milan, the 22nd Thermidor, 5th year of the Republic, 9th of August, 1797, appointing three inspectors of hospitals and hastened to read it to him, particularly directing his attention to the clause at the end of that document which orders, did it be ascertained whether the physician takes care to see his prescription attended to? This is one of your tricks, doctor, but no matter... You would probably also quote the letter that Bertillet wrote to the director respecting the excellent condition of our hospitals and the care I took of the wounded. I would rather take the pills. Give them to me. 26. The emperor, who had been tolerably well since the 21st, had a sudden relapse. The 27th. The emperor is still more unwell than yesterday. The cough was more violent, and he had experienced a painful nausea until 7 o'clock in the morning. Prescribed refrigerant and paragoric beverages, calming and anodyne enemas, and a foot bath, which produced a favorable effect. It was now 1 o'clock a.m., and Napoleon had only taken during the day three small quantities of broth, two eggs, a little cream, and a glass of claret. Diluted with a great deal of water, he slept four successive hours and remained in his apartment, the windows of which were hermetically closed. Towards evening, however, he changed both his room and his bed. At 3 p.m., I administered two spoonfuls of anodyne emulsion, which calmed the cough a little, an atomic pill. The emperor felt better. And old recollections recurring to his mind, he spoke in terms of praise and kindness of the brave man who followed his fortune and contributed to his success at the outset of his career. Stango was impetuous and indefatigable and sought for the Austrians and for medals with equal ardor. He did not leave a bush or a ruin unsearched or unvisited. Mirror was the man of dangers and outposts. He could only sleep quietly when in the presence of the enemy. Caffarelli, equally brave, only fought from necessity. He was fond of glory, but fonder still of mankind, and considered war but as a means of obtaining peace. Passing from these officers to an inferior rank, Napoleon praised the courage of one, the skill of another, and dwelt considerably upon the merit of two brave men, whose loss he deeply regretted. These were Solkovsky and Guibert. The first was a Pole, full of intrepidity, knowledge, and intelligence. He had gone to wake Kosciusko and to deliver him the instructions of the Comité de Salut Public. He was an able engineer, spoke every language of Europe, and no obstacle could deter him from his purpose. The second, possessing a greater degree of shrewdness, pliability of temper, and circumspection, conducted a negotiation with all the art of a diplomatist, as will be seen by the following report. Cairo, November 1798. At daybreak on the second, I left Abukir to proceed on board the English fleet. There was only one ship at anchor off the point. It was the Swift Shore, commanded by Mr. Hallowell. A boat came to meet me, and I asked the men in it whether the ship commanded by Commodore Hood was in the offing. I was told that it was not that Commodore Hood was cruising before Alexandria, but that Mr. Hallowell requested me nevertheless to come on board the Swift Shore. Mr. Hallowell received me coldly, particularly when he saw that I was accompanied by a Turk. I stated to him plainly the object of my mission to Mr. Hood. He replied that Hassan Bey would not receive the Turk and that the step I was taking was therefore useless. You will, however, permit me, sir, to go on board Mr. Hood's ship? 
he answered that he had himself some very interesting information to communicate to Mr. Hood that the zealous was almost out of sight, but that the signal to approach had been made, and he proposed to me to wait on board the Swiftsure. We will proceed together, added he, to see the admiral. He ordered breakfast. We sat down to table, and by degrees he became more friendly. Chance brought to his recollection some former connection that had existed between him and my family, and a conversation ensued, which was on my part frequently interrupted by sallies uttered with simplicity and without affectation. We conversed on the political situation of Europe, and he told me with an expression of truth that more than seven weeks had now elapsed since they had received any news and that they expected some every day. He spoke confidently respecting the hostile dispositions of Turkey. The news, answered I, which the general frequently receives from Constantinople by hand by land, does not agree with your statement. Does the general receive frequent news from Constantinople? Yes. He smiled but appeared surprised. Yet you cannot doubt that the passage of Rhodes is before Alexandria by order of his government? I was going to reply, but he continued, we were at Rhodes when he was forced to come. Forced? I smiled in my turn. Yes, by order of the sublime port. I did not insist. He then showed me your letter to the citizen Talleyrand, whom you have ordered to give to the Grand Seigneur an account of the events of Egypt, the details of the Battle of Abakir, and to tell him that we have still 22 ships in the Mediterranean. He ironically scrutinized the number of those which we have still left in that sea and added, Monsieur de Talleyrand has not arrived at Constantinople, and besides, he would no longer have found there your good friends, the Grand Vizier and the Rice Effendi. They have both been dismissed and sent away from the capital. He stopped, I feign not having paid attention to what he had said. He then spoke to me about the Russian squadron commanded by Admiral Oskov. Where is it, I asked. At the entrance to the Gulf of Venice. It will soon attack your islands. We cannot believe in the existence of the Russian squadron in the Mediterranean. You ought, for the interest of the coalition, to advise it to appear and show itself. But, answered Mr. Hallowell, almost nettled, you have already seen two of its frigates, and if it does not keep a more considerable force in those seas, it is because it forms no part of its system of operation to do so. The conversation fell upon some of our naval officers, and amongst others, upon Rear Admiral Villeneuve. Have you not taken any of the four ships that accompanied him? No, Le Rue which had been separated in a gale, has been fortunate enough to escape our pursuit and to enter Corfu, the remainder at Malta. And La Justice, also most probably. I have a cousin on board the last mentioned vessel. If he had been your prisoner, I should have asked your permission to send him some money. He belongs to a rich family. But stop, said he clumsily. I now recollect that La Justice has sunk. Tell me the name of your relation. I gave without hesitation the first name that occurred to me. Mr. Hallowell also spoke to me of a letter that had been intercepted coming from Toulon and addressed to you. It announced the departure of a convoy, which is to sail as soon as the English shall no longer cruise before the port. But Nelson is there. He assured me that some of your dispatches had been intercepted by the Turks and pretended that Ibrahim Aga was nothing more than a servant disguised and that Hassan Bey had said so. General Bonaparte answered, I only sends as a flag of truce persons bearing a public character. Ibrahim Aga is known and formed part of the Pasha's suite at Constantinople. I spoke to them of their connection with the Arabs and informed him that the chiefs of Edku and Elfini had been shot. I added that you were perfectly aware that the intendant of Ibrahim had gone from their fleet to Syria. He maintained with the utmost affectation that this information was false and that the fleet had no connection whatever with the Arabs. I almost immediately quoted proofs of the contrary. He then spoke of the junction of 50,000 Greeks, and I took care not to undeceive him. I told him that they had actually joined us and were organizing. 
At this moment, Hassan Bey arrived. He was followed by a Turk who is devoted to the English and who, in addition to being a mortal enemy of the French, appears to be of a most ferocious disposition. Mr. Hallowell seems surprised at seeing the Bey, but we continue to walk about, conserving, conversing together. Mahomed approached Hassan, waited a few minutes, and suddenly interrupting our conversation, took his letter out of his pocket and asked me whether he was to deliver it. Mr. Hallowell was surprised stopped and looked at the bay no answered i to muhammad you will only deliver it in the presence of mr hood you see sir said i to mr hallowell that it entirely depends upon mr hood's will whether his son shall receive the letter or not he begged me to allow him to withdraw and called the bay i feigned not to observe what was going forward his son bay returned in a short time and spoke to me about the war which the sublime port has declared against us and told me the angel and Russia were going to attack us jointly. Do you think, said I to him in Italian, that the port will ever unite with Russia, her natural enemy, and who only seeks aggrandizement at her expense? I repeated to him that you had frequent correspondence with Constantinople through Syria and that the Grand Signor was perfectly aware of it. The Turk who accompanied him told me with a ferocious expression that at Rhodes, 146 Frenchmen had been loaded with irons and that this measure had also been resorted to by all the pashas in the provinces under the superintendents. That measure will be one day disowned by the Grand Signor. In the meantime, let his sad bay be informed, added I, that in Egypt, religion is respected. The mosques consecrated, the Arabs repulsed. Let him read the proclamation of the divan, and he will recognize in the French the allies of the sublime port. I then delivered to him a proclamation, but he took it without reading it. Mr. Hallowell proposed to me to go over his ship, and I accepted. The French emigrant, employed as a pilot, came up to me on the upper deck. He appeared sincerely to regret his country, and asked me whether it it was true that 50,000 Greeks had joined us. He added, but in a lower tone of voice, that the Arabs who came on board every day related a hundred absurd stories that they began to be no longer believed and to cease to give satisfaction. He told me there were 11 French prisoners on board, and I expressed a wish to see them. They are soldiers of the Fourth Light Infantry. I asked them whether they were well treated. We have only half rations, answered they. An officer then hastily stepped forward and said to me, The crew itself has only half rations, I assure you. I believe it, sir, said I, for we and our prisoners always share alike. The ship commanded by Commodore Hood was still at a great distance, and Mr. Hallowell ordered dinner to be served. The formality of his manner seemed now considerably relaxed. He spoke to me of peace, of the ambition of our government, and concluded by these words, It is you that do not wish for peace. I recall to his mind, but without insisting upon it, that although conquerors of the continental powers, we had, however, always been the first to offer peace. That recently again, when Master of Styria, Cardiola and Corinthia, you had acted towards Prince Charles in the most candid and noble manner, and writing to him the following letter, which I quoted from one end to the other. General Chief, brave soldiers, make war and desire peace. Has not this war already lasted six years? Have we not killed men enough and done harm enough to suffering humanity? She appeals in all directions. Europe had taken up arms against the French Republic. But she has laid them down again. Your nation stands alone and blood is about to flow more than ever. The sixth campaign opens under sinister auspices. Whatever be its issue, we shall kill some thousand men on both sides and shall last be obliged to come to an understanding together. Since there is a limit to everything in this world, even to the duration of hateful passions, the executive directory of the French Republic 
had expressed to his majesty the emperor wish to put an end to the war which afflicts the two nations but the intervention of the court of london has prevented the accomplishment of this end there is no hope of accommodation and must we to serve the interests and passions of a nation who does not feel the evils of this war continue to destroy each other you general whose birth places you so near the throne and who must be above all the petty passions which often and blind ministers and governments are you not determined to deserve the title of a benefactor to humanity and of the true savior of germany do not think that i intend to insinuate that it is impossible that germany can be saved by your arms but supposing the chance of war to turn in your favor that country will be equally ravaged for my part general if the proposal I have the honor to make to you can save the life of a single human being, I shall pride myself more upon the civic crown I shall have thus earned than upon the melancholy glory that may result from military success. Well, said Mr. Hallowell, in whom this letter had evidently produced an effect to the conclusion of a peace honorable for both nations. At five o'clock, Mr. Hallowell, Hassan Bay, and myself embarked to go on board Mr. Hood's ship, where we arrived at eight in the evening. Mr. Hood's reception was still colder than Mr. Hallowell's had been at first. He made me walk in, went out of the room, and spoke for a length of time to Mr. Hallowell and Hassan Bay. When he came back, I said to him, you know, sir, the subject of my mission to you. Yes, but Hassan Bey will not receive Mr. Bonaparte's letter. He would, however, have received it this morning if you had allowed him. I dwelt with particular emphasis upon the last two words. Well, let the Turk present the letter. Hassan will receive it or not, just as he thinks proper. He's perfectly at liberty to do as he pleases. Mahomed presented the letter, which Hassan received and opened. The English interpreter approached, and they read it together smiling ironically several times as they proceeded mr hood also affected to laugh i have been very much surprised said he to me that the general should have sent me a turk as a flag of truce under the colors of turkey you doubt then the fact of the declaration of war by the sublime port against you i give you my word of honor that it is true what is mr bonaparte doing he has set off for Suez after having received a courier from that place. He has concluded a treaty of alliance with the Arabs of Mount Sinai and the princes of Mount Lebanon. I had already slightly spoken to some of the officers of the arrival at Suez of ships and transports. I afterwards asked Mr. Hood whether it was a long time since he had received news from Europe. More than seven weeks. I expect some every day and shall hasten to transmit the newspapers to Mr. Bonaparte. General Manscour has sent me a very amiable flag of truce, added he laughing to ask for his letters. I give you my word that I will transmit those that treat upon indifferent subjects. I will even forward a few lines to France or Italy. You are very kind, said I hastily. But it will be useless to give yourself that trouble. Since the beginning of September, a vessel sails every five or six days for France. Several officers and aides de camp of the general in chief have already been sent home in that way. Indeed! Assuredly, you must have taken several of them. Have you taken General Bonaparte's brother? How? Do you mean the, the brother of Mr. Bonaparte? Yes, he left Alexandria about 25 or 30 days ago. He appeared not to believe this intelligence, but I affirm the truth of it. However, he will not escape our superior cruisers. He then asked if I came from Abakir and whether I knew the letter addressed to him by the Adjutant General Descau, which he showed me, and which might have been better written. My intention, considered Mr. Hood, is to behave towards you as your nation will behave towards us. You see that I might have refused to see you, and I am even surprised that Mr. Hallowell received you on board his ship, coming as you did from Abakir. I replied that I had started from Rosetta, but that the passage over the bar of the Nile being too perilous, I had been obliged to come by way of Abakir, that it might besides be dangerous for us that flags a truce should penetrate into a fortress or oppose the position of which they might thus reconnoiter whilst it was no consequence whatever for them 
whether a flag of truce came from such or such a place, and when on board such and such a ship. In sending you your letters, resumed Mr. Hood, I shall not follow the example of your government, which has ordered that all letters addressed to Englishmen in whatever vessel they may be taken shall be carried to France. Your mode of carrying on the war is totally unprecedented. We shall in future act as you do and imitate your proceedings on every occasion. I believe, Commodore, and should I, did our two governments are quite on a par in that respect. As for General Bonaparte, he has always conducted war upon open and generous principles and consistently with the dictates of humanity. I then related to him the marks of attention you had shown Marshal Firm, sir, at the siege of Mantua, and that you had set him refreshments of every description for his sick, an act of generosity at which the old Marshal had been much surprised. I told him the humane manner in which the two belligerent nations had treated their prisoners, adding that I knew your intention was to supply the English with whatever might be wanted. Mr. Hood appeared surprised at this politeness, thanked me, and said that they were not in want of anything. I now mentioned to him that you wished the first flag of truce he sent might be addressed to Rosetta, but, said he, interrupting me, it seems to me more simple to send to Alexandria. The general requests you will have the kindness to dispatch flags of truce to Rosetta from whence orders are given to conduct them to Cairo. And in case of your doing so, the general begs you to select some intelligent person possessing your confidence. Very well. I will follow that plan. I seized this opportunity of proposing to a Protestant clergyman who had just manifested a great wish to see the pyramids to accompany me, promising that I would bring him back. The English interpreter now approached Mr. Hood and translated to him your letter to his son Bay. The commodore pretended to laugh immoderately. The interpreter came up to me and said, Hassan Bey has taken a French brig and has put the crew in irons. He will not return it and will act in the same manner with everything belonging to the French nation. Mahomet, having been the bearer of the letter, answered I, this reply must be addressed to him. Hassan Bey does not intend to make any reply whatever, either verbally or in writing. Mr. Hallowell now announced to me that the boat was ready. I took leave of Mr. Hood, who begged me to give his compliments to you. On our way back, Mr. Hallowell said to me, you must have had an engagement three days ago near Cairo. With whom, asked I. Murad has just been defeated by General Desai. I know it, but you will see. He added that a Turk I had seen on board Mr. Hood's ship had been sent by the Grand Seigneur to distribute presents and concert with the admiral measures of importance. Mr. Hood did not say a word of this to me, and the intelligence has not the slightest appearance of truth. Generally speaking, notwithstanding the outward and affected demonstrations of friendliness made to the old Pasha of Rhodes and his suite by the English, there does not appear to exist any cordiality between them, and I believe the English to be particularly dissatisfied with the Arabs. Mr. Hallowell told me that one day Hassan Bey had expressed to him his surprise at see the friendly communications between the French and English flags of truce, telling him that with them, Person sent on such an errand would run the risk of losing their lives. Mr. Hallowell could not refrain from replying to him, We are not barbarians! We arrived on board the Swiftsure at midnight. It was dangerous to depart at that hour on account of the guard boats that were going their rounds, and I therefore accepted a bed which Mr. Hallowell had sung for me in his own cabin and left him. The next morning, an officer told me that Admiral Nelson was expected, and I asked Mr. Hallowell whether such was the case, but he assured me it was not. The officer's communication looked like an act of indiscretion. You have judged, General, of the effect produced by the last flag of truce sent to General Mazkur, and you know that he proposed sending another. The last, it appears, lost his temper in speaking to Mr. Hood. It is from such men as these that a judgment is formed of the nation and of the spirit of the army. I also